You are about to hear two New York City-based artists discuss how to pursue God, music, and a fulfilling life. I'm Melinda May. I'm Trevor Knight, and this is Stronger Voices. <laughs> you good? Yeah. Okay. What? I don't, I just want to make sure. Okay. Why don't you welcome folks this time? I feel like I do it every time. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Two, the Stronger Voices podcast. <laughs> now that you feel so warm and fuzzy inside from such a personalized, beauteous welcome. We are coming to you live from Minneapolis. Minneapolis, Minnesota. In our kitchen. In our kitchen. That part has not changed. <laughs> we do that in New York as well. Yes. But yes, thank you for joining us today. I hope when you are listening to this, you are safe and healthy, and your family is too. We have some interesting stuff to talk about today. So we are going to be delving into the nuts and bolts of how a song goes from idea to streamable sonic product. We've gotten that question a handful of times um, from people that know us and know what we do. And if you are interested in doing that yourself, or if you have no idea what it's like as a musician to do that, you would have no idea because it's hard to know unless you've done it or unless you're going to get a tutorial like this. So we're going to go from writing the song to listening to it on Spotify, start to finish, how it's done, what the steps are, and I think it's going to be interesting and informative. And Yeah, and part of the inspiration um, for it too was uh, – so many people ask us who who want to put their own music out there and so we just wanted to convey that there's no there's no gatekeepers it's it's literally just it's really simple you can do it you can do it yourself you yeah. can absolutely do it so and you could do it qu quickly yeah and so we just wanted to go through it and yeah it's a question we both get a lot yeah from people that are even those that aren't interested in doing their own music you know my parents and family members ask me this stuff all the time what yeah, does it entail? How, how do you works. do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm confident you'll be interested. But before that, Let's do a quick, quick catch up on what life is like, what you're up to, what music and media stuff you're working on. Yep. So um, life in Minneapolis is day seven. It's been really fun. For those that missed the last episode, there's a lot of stuff going down in New York. So we yeah. are hunkering down at an Airbnb in Minneapolis for the time being. Yes. Um, and we've been here seven days, quarantined. So we we saw your family for two and a half hours, but very much practiced as much social distancing as we could. There, there was literally, so it was, it was Trevor's uh, older brother's birthday, and his parents set up chairs, like two by two for all the people who were quarantined with each other like eight feet apart from each other in yeah. this what trevor calls a lord of the rings circle so anyway so we did that for two and a half hours and then we have watched two movies yep and then aside from that that's uh, we've just been doing stuff we, fun stuff fun stuff we record we we write we spend time by ourselves writing um we you know, we've pray. been on a bunch of adventures. We go on adventures, bike rides, uh, yeah. and hikes, and things like that. Yeah, and so it's been a busy, like the, it's very much a, it's been a Trevor and Melinda time. Very it busy, has, yeah, very like good. fun, but also productive. So that's what I'm up to, and so I'm working on a few things right now, writing two brand new songs, and I'm so excited about the idea of releasing one of these songs that I'm writing. Right. I'm just going to record it really quickly. Yeah like an acoustic version and just release it. Yeah. Because typically when I write a song, I, I write it, I perform it, and we'll talk about all this in a second, but um, it takes a long time for me. It doesn't have to take long for everyone, but it takes a long time for me to get from writing a song to putting it out. Mm -hmm. And so I really am excited about this idea of like, I wrote the song, now you can listen to it three weeks later. So that's a little goal of mine. We'll see how that goes. And we're fortunate to have a good recording setup while we're stationed here. So the same setup we're using to record this podcast, we've been tinkering around with recording ourselves doing acoustic versions of songs. And so that's what she's referring to, that she may record something that she's writing right now and she'll record it during our time here and be able to release it, which will be really cool. Yeah, and I'll just record it. 
um, in the master bedroom, like the sound came out really nice and it's just going to be that simple. And yeah, we'll see how that goes. So that's what I'm up to. Did I miss anything? No, I think that's it. What are you up to, Trev? Same sort of thing. A lot of new material. So since we arrived here a week ago today, I have five songs that I didn't have one like a week ago. So there were a handful, I want to say two and a half, that were in various stages of completion. And during our first few days here, I finished those, and then I've written the other half of one of those and two new ones in that time. So I feel really good about the creative space that I'm in right now and I just I wake up wanting to do I think it it has to do with being in a new place like s- enormous change of circumstance and scenery brought about a time of inspiration which is great and you got to run with that cuz it's not always the case. Absolutely. So right now I'm just riding that wave trying to crank out new stuff and I feel very good about some of the stuff that I'm writing. That's so good. And similarly, I want to record a few things while we are here and see, um, I mean, maybe I'll do the same thing and release one of those. Um, but at a bare minimum, those will be great things to use to send to a producer to hopefully get stuff recorded down the road, which again, we will talk about in a minute. But yeah, I've, and another great thing is because we're isolated like this and we have the setup we've been able to record the podcast more than we normally do because we don't have to deal with all the scheduling and moving things around. And it's, it's been really good to just have the setup set up. Yeah. So feel very good about that. So all the, Music and media projects are going in a good direction. For yeah, sure. and we started it an Instagram for Stronger Voices. We did. So I've been working on that. So follow us at Stronger Voices Podcast. Um, but yeah, a lot. You've been writing a ton. I've also been writing. Um, it's just been a really good. It's been a really fruitful time. It has in a lot of ways. Yeah, it has. So let's get into the discussion for today. Let's so we want to share with you how a song goes from idea to something you can stream on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or wherever. So there are a lot of steps involved with that. And if you have no idea how to do that and you want to, or you just want to see what music is like, you wouldn't know unless someone explained it to you because you have to either just do it or encounter what we're about to give to you, which are the steps involved. So why don't we break down before we get into each individual step kind of an overarching summary of what the steps are from idea yeah. to streamability. So we have five steps essentially. And I think I would say that every artist goes through some version of this. So you write the song, then you perform and edit the song, then you do pre-production, which we'll get into if you don't know about that. And then you do production and then distribution. Um, so we'll start with writing and how you and some ways that you can write the song you know what's funny writing songs is not typically difficult (laughs) it's finishing the song oh definitely that is difficult of course yeah Yeah, like the songs that i the songs that i finished and i don't even know if they're totally finished yet because i haven't gotten to that second stage where you edit them and perform them and all that stuff but the songs that i've finished since we came here a week ago those were on my started songs list for for months yeah you know i started each of those a couple months ago and i just hadn't gotten around to that last whatever 20 25 percent of finishing you know that second verse and making sure you know the melody and the bridge and all this like yeah the transitions and all that stuff that those little things take a while to come together the initial idea can come to you really fast oh yeah yeah. So what are your what are some of your tips for finishing a song? How do you do it? Hmm. Hardo Trev Sesh. Hard Hardo Trev Sesh. I think that that's is That's literally th- what we call it. That's well, I think yeah. Um I don't know which one of us termed that. I can't remember. But I don't know. Probably me. So I think with as with a lot of things, as if you were working a desk job, as if you were being paid to change a tire, whatever, you give yourself a time where you say from 3 to 5 p.m. today, I'm going to finish this song. Like I have to do it. It is my job to finish this song. And you don't get up. You don't start making yourself food. You don't start checking your Instagram. You just do the thing. And again, if you were a mechanic working in a shop, you wouldn't have those options anyway, right? So you 
I think it's important to treat it like that sometimes and just approach the problem at hand as something that must be solved. And you will get it done. You know, yeah. you will. And even if you don't go from 80% to 100% and totally finish it in those in whatever time you set, you'll be further along than you would have been. Yeah. For sure. I think that's a really good tip. And I think that's necessary for an artist at some point. You will have to have a hard trev sesh. However, another thing I can offer is I I don't work like that normally. I, I, I do that if I absolutely have to. Um, you know, for example, when I did that thing on the Tonight Show, they were just like, you're going to write a song about texting your dentist and you have 30 minutes to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I did it, you know. It was like a self, it was a environmentally imposed hard or sesh. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Um, and, and there's times where... I, I do that for one reason or another, but I like to, um, as long as you do, as long as you write a little bit every single day, cause to me, I don't care when the song is finished. Typically I'm writing a bunch of songs at once. Mm -hmm. So as long as I work on it every single day, it will move forward. Um, so which also requires discipline cause that's hard to do. Right. So it just, no matter what you even if you've decided, uh, I hate this, this isn't going to work, pick it up and look at it. And if you, you're looking at it for, maybe that day you're looking at it for 15 minutes. Maybe that day you're obsessed for an hour. But if you pick that up every single day, you will, you'll get somewhere with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's kind of my method. And especially because, you know, sometimes if you're hard -o, sessioning it or whatever depending on what type of person you are it for me makes me feel like I'm in a box and then I lose my mm. groove and I'm like okay I gotta put this down go think of something else I'll come back to it yeah so it just depends you know but either way I think what we're both saying it here is under no circumstances give up yeah and it doesn't matter when you do it but you need some form of discipline structure something yeah because we, you know. we mentioned this in one of our earlier podcasts but if you sit around and rely on strokes of inspiration to come to you to finish songs you just won't get many of them done you'll get a few done mm -hmm. maybe um i finished a song a couple days ago that was entirely one of those i sp had the stroke of inspiration and you know two three four hours later i had this song but that's not how life works a lot of the time. You don't have two, three, four hours to totally play something out. And it might be months before you get another one of those urges to totally immerse yourself in the creative process. So if you wait around for that to happen, you're going to have a tough time finishing a product. So you, I, I agree. You need some semblance of discipline to However that works for each person. Right. Some semblance of discipline somewhere, whatever whatever tool you use to get that done. And number two, you have to commit to not giving up on the song. Mm -hmm. And something I think that's really helpful, um, two things. Number one is that commit to finishing the song even if you don't like it, mm. which is really difficult. And number two, um, write first, edit later. So sometimes if I just cannot get, and I, I do this too with lots of things. Um, I call it, I guess I don't call it, but I got this idea from somewhere. If you if you can't get a good idea, start generating bad ideas that you know are bad and terrible. And I do this with all sorts of things. And just list a bunch of terrible ideas. Get something out of your mind and into and just keep a going. note or a notebook or a, yeah. And eventually something. you will generate good ideas. Yeah. And so write first, edit later. Write the song. Make it horrible. You can hate it. And then edit but yeah. now it's done. Yeah. You know, and I, w so. I was doing that this morning where I had a line in one of my verses that I thought was good and I couldn't think of another line. So I literally just started writing down lines that had that ended with the right rhyme and that had the right amount of syllables. And some of them were totally unrelated. Senseless. Some of them <laughs> were really dumb and, and a few of them worked out. Yeah. You know, and one of them I'm probably going to choose. But you, you're right. You got to get stuff down on paper or in your phone or on your computer or whatever. You got to get things out of your mind and just in front of you. And some yeah. of them are going to be bad, but some of them, if you do it enough times, some of them won't be bad. Right. Um, yeah. And give yourself permission to hate your song. You can hate it, you know, <laughs> but finish it. 
finish it and then set it down. Even if you hate it three days later, listen to it. You might not. That's happened to me Mm -hmm. too. You know, there was this song I told you, I'm like, I don't like this song. I played it for you. And you're like, why don't you like it? I'm like, I just don't like it. And just yesterday I'm like, it's pretty good. (laughs) You know? (laughs) So you never know. Yeah. You do never know. I have voice memos on my phone. I'm sure you have dozens of them that you just record and you know, somewhere down the line, you stumble back upon them and you can use them again or, you know, refurbish them. Or Oh my gosh. All the time. Yeah. I just had that just happened to me today. We were sitting here and I like said something and you're like, what? I'm like, oh, it's lyrics from March 3rd. <laughs> and that, that those lyrics that I found on March 3rd, I just wrote a song to. It's not finished, but all the elements are there. Two verses, a hook, yeah. a bridge um, from that those little lyrics that I jotted down a month ago. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, so that can go in a lot of ways, but, um, I think the main points here are you have to employ some sort of discipline. However, that works for Mm -hmm. you commit to not giving up. Yeah. And yeah. And we didn't get too much into the weeds on how you write the song itself, what your creative process is. I mean, we can do that on a different podcast. It's probably its own discussion, honestly, but it, and it, the main reason for that also is that it's going to be way different from one person to the next. Like I always start with melody. So I take a chord progression that I like. I listen to it many, many times and I would shed melodies over the top of it. I just hum melodies over the top of it. Then I try to find some sort of lyric that I think fits that melody tonality wise and rhythmically. And then I build a concept based on that lyric that popped into my head that fit the melody I had first. But and that works really well. But yeah, but that's different. Like some people write a poem first and they just have lyrics and they fit music well, to it. I've seen you do the thing where you like get a chord progression you like and you'll you, you'll find a melody and then you'll find lyrics that match that melody. I don't do that. I don't work like that. It comes to me at the same time. Mm. And I try to explain this and I don't know how to, but I just will start singing lyrics to whatever mm. melody it is. And then as... And then I'll write down those lyrics in my phone. And, and yeah, so for me, it's, it's pretty much like a, a lyrics first thing. And then once I have the lyrics, I try to genuinely discover what they sound like. Mm. Um, so that's so interesting. Yeah. And, and that's going to be different for every person. Yeah. So there's a lot the, yeah, we should do a podcast on the creative process because it, w- it would be really interesting, but, um, yeah, so that's that's at least some idea of how it goes from nothing to a finished to song. A, to a finished written song. Yeah. And then we move into bullet point number two of five for this process of getting a song from idea to distributed product, and that is sharing slash editing slash performing the song. So the reason that's important is because If you take your song that you've written and you've workshopped and you love it maybe and you take it to your producer or someone who's... You take it right into the studio and you start recording it. Mm -hmm. You will realize instantly that it's not done. (laughs) (laughs) You will. I promise you, you will. Because when you write a song and then you put it against anyone, any other human... Any other pair of ears that isn't yours. You hear it differently. You do. And so before you take all that time and take it into the studio and all of that expense and whatever it is, you have to make sure that you, someone else, you could send it to your mom, play it Mm -hmm. for your best friend, do an open mic, but it's going to be a waste if you don't, if someone else doesn't hear it Yeah. because then it's like you're hearing it new for the first time and you, the chances of you changing something about that song are so high. Yeah. And even, even doing it yourself, you know, in your apartment, Act as if you were performing it, you know, like when you start when you start writing a song and you get in the weeds and you get stuck on the second verse for a long time and you finally think you crack it and you're like, okay, I have this song. It's done. You have to go back to this, the top and play intro through outro, however long the song is, three, four minutes to see what it sounds like in its entirety, because there are going to be transitions maybe between bridge and chorus or second verse into chorus or whatever that don't sound the way you thought they sound when you viewed in the context of the entire song so even performing it for yourself as an entire unit is a is a good first step for that that's a very good point i remember it's because i remember struggling with that when i first started with like not being not 
playing my songs from beginning to end during rehearsal, just being like, Oh, I got this. I got this. I got yeah. this or, or writing it, you know, but, and then I remember when I transitioned to no, it has to be played from beginning to end. That's a really good piece of advice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then another thing, it depends where you are and what kind of things you like to do. But since we happen to be based in New York, something I love to do because I love performing too, but I love to take things to open mics. The mm -hmm. first thing I do after I write a song, I perform it for myself, I bring it to open mics. I do open mics all the time, and you can just tell as you're performing the song what needs to change. It's amazing. You have the song that you love and you think is great, and you bring it in front of an audience, even if it's five people, and you can just tell as you're playing it Certain things are received, certain things aren't received, certain turns of phrase that you thought sounded great in your mind once you're saying it to other people don't sound as great. Um, so that's a great way to do it is put it in front of people that don't know you, totally unbiased third-party audience. Yeah, agreed. I think that's really important. But either way, what e maybe... Or you like to send it to people, too. You like to send song files to people, right? Yeah, I do that all the time. Like, if I write a new song I'm really excited about, I'll send it to Erica, maybe my mom, certainly you, Taylor. Um, yeah, and then even with those people who know me and have been with me for so long, I could still just tell, you know? I could tell uh, just having, just me knowing that Taylor heard it makes me think about it differently, it's it's a it's a weird thing um even before she gives feedback or anything you know i just kind of it, you just know you just know if something mm -hmm. lands just a little awkward you know and that any one of those things that we just talked about in that edit or share stage are kind of weird or awkward or difficult to do you know it's hard to send something that you've worked on and that has some piece of you in it even to someone like your mom, who you know loves you and is going to love the things that you do, it's it's always a little weird to you send do it. to send do them it. something and ask for their opinion. But you do need to do it. You mm -hmm. do because, because you don't know you don't know how it sounds outside your head. And eventually, I mean, you're going to have to do that anyway. So you yeah, you should do it now. If your goal is to it's have it distributed you. to anyone, mm -hmm. you want someone who's close. Save yourself close time and yeah. money. <laughs> you want someone who's close to you to be honest with you. Yeah. Before you distribute a song that doesn't hit the way you want it to hit. Yeah. Because no one told you that it would do that. Right. And I will say it's less about the f feedback that the listener gives because those people generally are going to be like, oh, it's so great. Right. But there's something about you knowing how you it's now it's not just this idea that's in your head mm -hmm. now you there's something about you knowing that someone else has heard it um that changes the way you think about it so it's not so much that you're looking for feedback it's that you're you're almost practicing before you get into the studio right. having someone else have heard the song right. because you don't want the first person who ever hears it to be the producer because you're going to get really oh, self-conscious that's that's a good point and and we'll get into when we get to bullet four, which is production, we'll get into that, what it's like in the studio, but you don't want to be performing the song for the first time in the studio because then you're going to become instantly cognizant of, oh my gosh, someone else is listening to this song. No one else has ever heard it. And then you're going to start to have those thoughts. Oh my gosh, this should change. This doesn't sound as good as I thought it sounded. Yeah. And you're already in the studio paying for time to record it. So yeah, you yeah. don't want that to happen. So let's talk about the next point, which is pre-production. Pre <laughs> and I'm a huge nerd when it comes to this stage. So and I'll all let things. And most things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you go first. What does pre-production look like for a Melinda May song? So it's funny. I skipped pre-production for the longest time, and it's so important. That's so, so interesting. Yeah. Even on my first song, pre-production was the stage. I just strapped up the boots and <laughs> got into i'd love it well that's good but when i started i mean i was like 20 years old you know and i mean yeah and i had no clue i just showed up at the studio and i was like here are my songs what do we do next yeah. you know so it took me a while to learn that that's um what to do but so pre-production the first thing that i do is find what tempo my song is at mm, very important it's almost guaranteed that you are going to play your last chorus uh, at a faster tempo than you would play your first verse. So when you're performing it live, 
Yes, when you're performing it in your bedroom, when you're writing it. When you don't have a drummer or a metronome or something in your ear. Right. So the reason why the tempo is important is because we, we, as you build on top of that song, um, in order for it to sound like a real song and tight and uh, cohesive and a well-produced song, it has to be at the same tempo all throughout. So anyway, um, so you've got to find what beats per minute your song is. And so, and again, you have to play your song from beginning to end and make sure, does the bridge sound good at this tempo? Does the first right. verse sound good at, at this yeah. tempo? So after I find that, I... And quick aside, if you're totally unfamiliar with that, the, every song that you'd hear on the radio has a beats per minute speed. And all that means is just what the cadence of the song is. How many and it how, never how many beats fit into a minute? That's what BPM is or beats per minute. So when you're in the studio, you're recording that to a click that's in your ear that's at that beats per minute whereas mm -hmm. you don't have that when you're performing live so your tempo can vary when you're performing live yeah. but you have to like melinda said you have to find a tempo that works for the entire song if you were to record it at that same tempo and when i first started recording music i could i could not play to a click and i think this is helpful for anyone who might be starting out i could not and i would sit in my living room with my laptop with my headphones on like family just kind of ignoring me and just play over and over and over to this metronome until I could get it. Um, so that might be what you have to do, but uh, it's it's hard to play to a click at first. Mm -hmm. Metronome and click is the same thing. Anyway, so after I get that down, I record it on just on my iPhone memos or any simple recorder to the click. Um, and then I, I listen back and make sure it's it's still the right tempo. And then... Since I have that file, just my guitar and my voice and the same thing, super simple, uh, you could you could do a couple of things at that point. Throw it into GarageBand on your phone or on your computer or any software you have. Mess around with some, some um, drum samples, drum noises and stuff like that just to kind of experiment. Or what I do most of the time is I just take my guitar and my vocals and I bring it right to my producer just like that, but record it to a click. And then together we build on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, you really can't start doing that until you find some comps. Mm, right, right, right. And w something quick she just mentioned, when you find a producer, that word means a lot of different things in other industries. You know, a producer could be someone who organizes events, but a, a producer in, in terms of music is someone generally who builds the instrumentation of a song and who helps you record it. So a producer would, you know, create digitally the sounds that you want to record over to put your vocals on top of. And so when she says she'd send it to a producer, the individual is someone who does that. Um, but the step that she just mentioned, finding comps, um, is important. And all that means is you find songs that are good references. So songs that exist that everyone knows or that you can send them a link to and they can listen that you want your song to sound like. Right. So there is this, uh, there's this Alessia Cara song called 17. And this is an example. I love the snare in that song. Go look up the song 17 by Alessia Cara and this like the snare sound. It's just like it's so right. And so I took that to producer, my producer. And I'm like, I want something like this. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're listening to music, like for the longest time, too, I could not articulate what I liked about a song. But at least I could find something and be like, I like the way this feels. I like the way this um, this seems to me and I don't exactly know what is doing it to me. And then hopefully a good producer will be like, okay, that's where the producer comes in. That's the difference between artist and producer. And it's good to hone skills on both sides, but, um, you know, as an artist, you don't always know the little technical things you want to mm -hmm. put in your songs. Right. So handy. Shout out to Musty to have a producer who like helps you to get from these like ideas you have to to what right. that actually sounds right. like. So that's how you do it. So you send them a pretty bare guitar and vocals and then a couple song references on I want something to this sort of end. Yeah. Yeah. But and I'll also use specifics too, like this noise in this song or this these drums, oh my gosh, there's a Kendrick Lamar song and the drums in it, I love. And I used Kendrick Lamar sounding drums on my song 
you can't speak my language. Two totally different genres, right. totally different things going on there. But those drums were like just the sound yeah. of them. I was like, I want that. Yeah. And so we, we tried to like recreate something similar. So it's stuff like that. And side note, you don't have to be worried about copycatting because th- that's how that's how music yeah. works. No, and, and <laughs> yeah, no, unless you use the exact same program, no drum is going to be exactly the same as any other. And you're not going to. Yeah, you're not going to run into any problems no. with that. And it's if something inspires you, you like the sound of something, copy it. Yeah, even a chord progression or something like yeah. that. No one owns chord progressions. And if you listen to country radio, you definitely know that because a lot of them are <laughs> yeah. the three, four chords repeated. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so... What's your pre-production process it's, like? Because it's, it's much similar. different than mine. Well, y- there are some differences. Thematically, it's very similar. Yeah. So I do the same thing where I... Um, after I've performed it a bunch at open mics and after I think I have a final version, I'll find a tempo. So I have, you can, there are a bunch of different apps. You listen to a metronome, you listen in garage band, you find a tempo that works for the entire song. Same, same thing. Then I'll record the entire song. So I'll put some makeshift drum loop into garage band, which is an audio program that comes on every Mac computer. I'll record the entire generally piano line to that because i grew up playing piano i'll record the chords and maybe a bass line and piano to the entire song i'll record my vocals separately and i call that a scratch track because i'll just do one pass over the entire song and just record the vocals for what i want it to sound like it doesn't need to be radio ready it just needs to be something i can share with a producer who can help me build it so now i have this recording it has Percussion, it has some melody in it from the piano, and it has my vocals. Then I strap up the boots, and I get into sending, you know, a very thorough email to whoever's going to produce this song. And I (laughs) I think it has to do with just, I grew up as a choir kid, I studied music theory, I studied economics, I worked in finance. I love the idea of building a soundscape as a project, you know, getting into the nuts and bolts of how things sound. So I'll send them this long email, whoever I decide was going to produce this song, where I'll give them everything they could ever want. So I'll do the same thing where at the top of the email, I'll say, I want this song to have the general vibe of these, this song or these two songs. I want it to have this energy, this positivity, whatever. Then I'll do the same thing for... I'll literally list out the instruments. So drums, bass, electric guitar, acoustic, piano, backing vocals. Like what would you say about bass though? Like what Bass I would say you know, I want it to sound so on not that kind of guy, right? Not that kind of guy was recorded with all live instruments. So um the guy playing bass um and the guy mixing it, I told them I want it to sound like someone's playing it live. I want to hear plucks of strings. I want to hear the resonance, but I also want it to have a little gravel so that it sounds like a real bass. Mm -hmm. On Giving It Up, for example, a different one of my songs, or I Deserve Better, which is another pop song that's coming out soon, those are digitally produced bass sounds. So I told them I want deep, resonant, rounded bass sounds that fill out the lower frequencies of the track. So I do the exact same thing. Yeah. Yes. So I'll, I'll literally list out every instrument. I want it to be like this. And a lot of times in those instruments, I'll give them song references. So, right, like this in exactly Not That Kind of Guy, yeah. I said there's, I want an electric guitar line on the 16th notes that just stays on one the whole time. And I said, you can listen to it in this song called Hotel Key by Old Dominion. They do it. I want it just like that. Um, even on even on things they haven't recorded yet. Vocal production, I'll say, I want my vocals to sound like this song. I want the reverb to be you know misty but not super echoey or things like that and then at the bottom of that email i'll attach all the nitty-gritty so i'll attach a lyric sheet i'll attach a chord chart over the lyric sheet so they can and and those help when they listen to the sound file of the scratch track that i recorded clarify here you're not in the room with your producer when he's producing so that's a big deal i am yeah so i've Mm -hmm. never been in the room when they're when they're engineering this thing that I'm going to send them. So that's why I send them so many things is because every additional thing I send them is one less email I'm going to have back and forth with them as 
Because, you know, they're working in a studio somewhere else in New York or not even in New York, and they're going to build something, they're going to send it to me, and then I can listen to it and say, oh, I want the bass to sound different, or I can just tell them at the outset, I want the bass to sound this and give them a lot of specifics. Yeah. And it cuts down on the communication. Yeah. So let's get into production then, because what is your production step like? So... The production, once I send that email, and it, you know, it has a bunch of other things in it too, like, um, you know, I, I color code it, I get, you know, deep in there, but. Well, what else is in there? Um, so I will put, so I put the chords on top of the lyrics, so like as they listen to that sound file, they can hear when, um, like they can hear when the chords change, because whoever's playing it, I want the I want the syncopation and I want the rhythm to be the same. Right. And, uh, you know, maybe that you can intuit that by listening to the sound file or a good producer can, but it's nice to not give them any doubt. Um, and then I'll give them some freedom sometimes too. So I'll be like, I'm not totally sure on what I want on the high end in the bridge, but I want something. Maybe try an arpeggiated synth, maybe try some sort of plucked, you know, electric guitar, whatever you want to do, mess around with a few different things, send me some ideas. Um, but yeah, once you get past that, so once you or I send something to a producer, you move into the production stage. So step number three in this process where you actually start to build the recording that you're going to send out. So for me, what that would look like is this producer gets this email from me. It has a sound file of what I've recorded in my apartment. It has all the notes on how to build it. And then they go into an audio program and they start to build it. So they pick drum sounds. They pick bass sounds. A lot of times they will plug in a guitar or a keyboard directly into their computer and um, instrument some of those sounds in an analog sense, which is cool. And they'll start to build an instrumental. And... So a lot of times you're there when that's going on. I'm never there when that's going on, or I haven't been yet, uh, besides the song we recorded together, which was mostly acoustic instruments. Yeah. So then they do that, and then you have a back and forth. So for me, it's normally they send me a rough draft of an instrumental. What do you think of this? I'll listen to it. I'll listen again to some songs that I think I want my song to sound like, and I'll say uh change this or uh the bass isn't quite what i wanted or i'll say great let's move forward from there yeah so a few things at this juncture number one for pre-production you like i think it's incredible that you do all of that and that's probably so not probably 100 percent is so helpful for, for the producer and it's probably saving you a ton of time and money all that said, if you're just starting out, you, you don't need to do. You that. don't need to do all that. <laughs> I like I I I genuinely yeah. like doing those things. Yes, I yeah. like to listen. And things it's right. Out. It's so right and good yeah. and amazing. But I just, I mean, like, if yeah, you don't you don't need to do that for pre-production. You do need to you you need to do a few things. Like, what would you say? What would you tell people who are just starting? You have to do this for pre-production. Song references. And okay, I would and say you need to record. You need to have a home recording of it at a tempo you want. Home and recording, tempo, song reference or references. Right. Because and that's it, what you yeah. need for pre-production. And part of the reason I do all those specific things is because I have a specific vision for my song. If you don't have that, or you want someone else's vision, you want someone else who's creative to take a crack at your song, then skip all that stuff. Send them a recording and say, "I like this song by Ariana Grande a lot. I want it to sound kind of like that." show me what you got right send me some stuff <laughs> you're funny yeah just the way you think of that is so yeah. like uh it's so not um like no fear of this person who might know more than you about how to do this you know yeah. you're very much like well i don't know what are you gonna yeah. do yeah. but when you're start, that's not typical you're very l not a typical yeah, thinking i mean yeah artist but um if that does sound if that does sound like, some, you know, if you have a vision for your song, if you have an idea, if you hear a song that you want the bass to sound right. like, write it down. Yeah. Where, where and if you don't, that's fine. I And I put that in the notes a lot of times, too. Pick whatever. I'm not that. And, and you you probably have different opinions on drums than I do. I, I have very little to say about drums. Like, I, I 
think of melodic instruments as much more important. So I, I'll have detailed notes for all those, and a lot of times I'll say, I want the kick to hit hard, I want the snare to not be too distracting, and do whatever else you think best with yeah. drums. So, so I do that stuff too, where I'm like, just do whatever you think best. You're the producer. You work with drums all day. Yeah. If, do whatever drums you think sound best with the song. Yeah, so that's a good segue into what production is like for me because that's exactly what I do in the studio. So for me, I take my um, thing, pre-produced song, I take it to Tim Husty, Joe Loftus, and Jay Preston. And we, the first thing we do is we map it out. The truth is the first thing that is usually done is that Jay uh, Preston looks over the structure of the song and he, I don't think he even knows he does this, but he typically changes something. <laughs> and he does. He's like, you know, he, he's like, what do you think about not having this measure here? What do you think about shortening the bridge here? What do you, you know, and rearrange stuff. And it's so helpful. And then, that is helpful. yeah, I, I've never had a, besides the time we recorded a song together and we worked with Jay, I've, mm -hmm. I haven't had a different producer do that. Yeah. It's really cool. And then he'll, he'll listen to it and say, mm, I think like it's missing f uh, a measure yeah. here. Cause most producers view whatever they're handed as this is my work. I'm doing this for money. I'm going to do what this person tells me to do to the best of my ability. Yeah. And, and a lot of times producers are given songs of genres they don't care about or songs that they don't like at exactly. all. And they just have to do the thing. So like we were saying with you being not your typical situation, this is not a typical situation because I have worked with the same producers right. for almost not 10 typical. years. Yeah. So it's a different relationship for sure, but they're also amazing producers. Um, but anyway, so, so that's the first step. And then we kind of get the structure of the song down and then we go through the first thing is, I feel like the whole song, the whole vibe and feel of the song is going to be built on what that bass sounds like. Is it this like mm. gritty robot? We, I think we agree on that. Yeah. I think we agree yeah. on that. You're, you're so, yeah, bass oriented. But I'm more not notes of the bass like you're oriented to, the sound of the bass. Mm. Do I want it to sound like this like gritty robot? Do I want to sound like this booming fat bass? Do I want it to sound like a live bass? And off of that vibe of that bass sound, we're going to build all of our other production details so you get the bass sound um and then we look to drum sounds which yes i am very particular about i want my snare see to i'm sound. not yeah yeah that's I, interesting i got a thing for snare drums i want them to sound right and they th the snare will change the feel of a song completely oh i agree does I it agree. sound like a real snare sometimes this the snare on a song is just a clap or a snap yeah. sometimes it's this really like washed out <laughs> thing going on like there's yeah th there's so much and that that goes into the That's song so too interesting, yeah i almost so. always just leave that to the producer and the notes i have on drums are uh the kick has too much bottom end or the snare is too distracting the can you just turn it too. down yeah Th i'm very um interested in what my kick drums sound like because same thing you know like they really go into the feel of the song mm -hmm. so this is all what i do in, and we do in the production stage together you're with the producer doing these things yeah oh yeah for sure and then after those things are done then we'll start to talk about what high-end stuff and this is where i, I care very little um oh, I care not a lot that i care very little stuff. but i care less about what's going on in the high end uh, I'm just like something, let's try this, let's try that. But yeah. I'm just less particular about that. Yeah. Um, I don't particularly l like a ton of like high end nonsense in songs. Like even in songs that I listen to, it just, yeah. if it's too, there's something about it that just, sure. I just don't like. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too oriented to that. But anyway, so bass, drums. Then you're going to pick like a, a high end that's going to carry the melody, which is going to be a piano or a guitar or something like that. Then one of the most fun parts is, OK, now you've got this song, but it's kind of um, homogenous, really. Yep. It kind of sounds like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, yep. bridge, chorus. So now you, you need something that's going to lift the choruses, which is a really hard thing to achieve. And usually that's done by synths or things with um, sound effects in the background the bass or the drums. Um, and you get then some drum fills, you get some crash cymbals, you get some whoosh sound exactly effects. Exactly, yeah. right. Some effects, like you want to find things that only happen in your song once. Mm. Maybe, maybe, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, that's how I think of it. Like this thing is only going to happen once right here. And I, I think that's a good way to think of it. Yeah. yeah, and this other little thing that you can barely hear, but you just put it in there as like a detail and it yeah. adds to the... No, there are a lot of things in songs that you you 
can't hear. You can't. But you would hear if they weren't there. Exactly. And I love doing that too. Like one of my favorite things is like, as you said, that uh, the guitar note that's on one, like yeah. that just plucks on one, a piano note that's just like yeah. eighth notes on one and you can barely hear it. Yeah. There's so much in my songs that you can like barely hear, yeah. but if they're not there, you can tell. Right. So anyway, so this is production and that's what it's like. And it's really... um Important step yeah. that we didn't talk about, what? tracking and recording your vocals. Oh my gosh. We're both singers. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to, how do you do it? Um, so after all the stuff that we both just talked about, you have, you know, an instrumented song. You have the bones of a song. You don't have any words or lyrics or melody in there yet. Then you track your vocals. So you go into the studio, you have that instrumental playing in your ears and you sing your vocals over them. And a lot of times the way I will do it, I think you do it differently than I do, but I generally take it chunk by chunk. I generally do first verse. Or That's how most people do it. Yeah. Um, or sometimes what I'll do is, you know, to get the right levels, which just means to make sure at different parts in the song when I'm really soft or really loud, the engineer who's ever running the recording booth knows how to adjust things and doesn't get caught off guard i generally sing the entire thing through once and we won't even use that take but i'll sing it just to get what i want the performance to sound like so i will have sung it once all the way through all the sound will be ready the engineer knows what to expect at different times in the song and then we'll start from the beginning verse one do a couple takes verse two do a couple takes chorus do a couple takes kind of chunk by chunk it and then you comp all those things, and sometimes the engineer can help with that. The engineers you work with generally do that for you, which is great and very helpful. Um, yeah. And then after you do that, you do backing vocals, which is one of my favorite parts. But how do you record vocals? So it's a little different because by the time... So first of all, I want to say that most... The typical process of recording vocals is exactly what you said. You make a scratch track, a scratch vocal track that you just sing once. And then after that, you sing the verse and you listen to every line in the verse and you try to decide yeah. which lines you want to put together. Um, but for me, by the time I go into the studio with a song, I have sung it literally 50 times, like at least. And... I sing my songs, and my producers have noted this too, exactly the same way every time. My vocals are exactly, like, I know exactly what I'm doing with my vocals. You can almost barely tell the difference between takes. So I sing the whole song three times, and I perform it. I perform it once. I don't even listen to it. I perform it twice. Maybe I'll listen to a part or something if I'm not sure. And then Jay will say, okay, how do you feel? good want to do it again one more time and I perform it for a third time and that's it because I've learned in the studio that I can nitpick myself forever and so now I just the pendulum swung the other way at some point <laughs> and I just don't I'm like this is how I, I sing it I've sung it 50 right. times literally um and even like my inflections and stuff like that like I choose them in my bedroom so I guess that's part of my pre-production yeah um so uh, so yeah, I just sing the song three times and then my producers go through and they choose what, ver so you can Frankenstein a song, meaning like if the lyric, and that's the typical way to do it. Yeah. So if the lyric is, I'm not that kind of guy, I'm not that kind of might sound really good. And then, but on another take that Trevor sang it, he might want to use the guy. And so they'll literally Frankenstein as we call yeah, it. Yeah. You take one take and another take, and you put them on the same line. So you didn't actually sing the phrase that you're going to hear, but you sang each individual part at different times, and they blend them together. Exactly. And so my producers do that, and then they play it for me, and usually I'm just like, great. Yeah. I don't spend a lot of time um, nitpicking my which, vocals. Which, again, is not typical. Because not typical. I think mostly because of the relationship you have with your producers. Because, again, most producers are hired to do a job and they know that they're being paid by you so a lot of times they're like i don't know what you want or, or yeah, you'll, yeah you'll record the first verse three times and you'll listen through all three of them and they'll say which one do you want 
or which oh, one yeah. do you think is the best? And that's so, I'll say this, like I give people a lot of credit. Like that's so difficult. Oh, I For hate me, it. That's my least favorite part of this entire yeah. thing. You have to, having to listen to your own voice back and decide yeah. which Listen to is you best. say, yeah, like yeah. one phrase seven times and pick which one you like the most. I yeah. hate that. But you got to do it. But you, you do have to do if it. If you don't have like a producer who who, who knows will you like, do that yeah. or it's very possible that you can say to your producer guy like hey man like can yeah. you listen through oh, and i do i do that all the time yeah. too where we'll record a couple of lines and they sound similar to me and i just tell him to pick the one he thinks sounds best because again a third party vantage point is probably better than mine anyway because i've heard the song a million times exactly so no, no matter what you, it's really helpful and good to Turn to whoever's next to you in that room, producer, engineer, yeah. a friend you've brought along, whatever, and and ask them because you will get so lost listening to your own vocals. Oh, totally. And you it's can't the worst. hear them anymore. You forget what the song's about. Yeah. Forget, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. You, yeah. That's why it became so important to me to perform the song three right. times because you are exactly right. You you forget the song and yeah. it just becomes about being this technically good singer. Right. And then you listen to it back and it just sounds not real right. to me and so i didn't like that and yeah. then i uh nixed that yeah. so yeah so then you do that and you have um lead vocal line that you like that's probably a combination of a few different takes then w i don't want to get too in the weeds here but then you do backing vocals which i love i love stacked harmonies i always have acapella nerd i i love doing it the first thing i do is go to the choruses and do a harmony above and a harmony below the lead line. Um, then I'll listen through the verses, see if there's anything I want to add or any... A lot of times the end word of a line, I'll just throw harmonies on but leave the rest of the verse as just the lead. Then I'll go to the last chorus and just flood it with backing vocals. Uppers and lowers and I'll put a lot of stacked ooze in there that you can barely even hear but you would notice if they weren't. And it's just a nice rounded sound underneath. And then you do ad libs, which are really fun. So you listen to the last chorus and all the backing vocals and the lead vocals are playing and you just throw fun stuff on top of it. Yeahs and <laughs> woes and all sorts of fun stuff. Yeah. I do something really similar. So the, just the song plays through and I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> I just sing and yeah. it's a high harmony. It's a low harmony. Or sometimes I sing the melody line an octave lower, which I love. And there's all, we could get into such nitty gritty about production. Yeah. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Like I love to sing really, really close with my mouth really, really close to the microphone because it picks up your lower tones when mm. you do that. And so, um, I love recording like an octave, like I'll put my lips on the, um, help me pop filter pop filter yeah uh and then sing the melody line an octave lower than it mm -hmm. is and then put that really really low in the mix and it sounds so yeah. cool but we can get really bogged down in different yeah. production things right there's yeah. so many things like yeah. that and then there's um then there's the inevitable stage where you get this finished track you go home you you don't think about it for a day or two and then you listen to what's in the studio and you're like i need to change this 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 and this or i need yes. to re-record the bridge or yeah. i need to change verse one or whatever it is you end up changing it um that inevitably happens and yeah. it has to be done because you're not gonna you, it's very rare that you get it right on your first swing yeah you could it really is it really is up to you i I struggle with this. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I'm making my song better, but I'm certainly making it more of what I want it to mm -hmm. be, which is important. Yeah. So, but yeah, typically after you get a song home from the studio, you listen to it a hundred times, let it alone for a few days, two yep. days or something, listen to it back. And then you're going to want to change something. Yep. And it's not gonna be a major change. It might just be a matter of, um, take the drums out in the bridge or the bass is too loud in this part or whatever, yeah. but and that's all you're going to edit it. Yeah, and that's also enveloped in the process of mixing. So as you're tracking, you're mixing, and as you're doing those things, you're mixing. As you give notes back to the producer on what to change, and all mixing is is taking each element of the song, each instrument, each drum sound, each effect, each backing vocal, and you're addressing them on volume levels, on panning left to right, on effects you want on them like echo or reverb um, or gravel or whatever you want. So e each one of those individual sounds, you can make sound different. So as you listen to that track um, that you recorded in the studio and you send them back notes, 
they're doing the process of mixing, which is taking all the individual elements of the song and making one collective soundscape that fits together well. Right, and there's a lot with mixing. Like, you don't notice this, but in songs, there are sounds sometimes that you can hear in your left that you don't hear in your right, right. and that's called panning. Yeah, there's you could put something that you're hearing. It's so bizarre how sound works, but you could hear it in the center or you could hear it in the bottom. Yeah, you know, so all of that goes into mixing too. And then there's this thing called mastering, which is basically the best way that I can describe mastering to you is that it makes all of the sounds the like I have a song, I have several songs that there's 148 tracks. There's 148 different things going on in that song. So tracks at meaning, one time. Yeah. Track for the drums, track for the keys, track for a random sound, track for vocal, track for each background vocal. And it's 148 things. And what mastering does is it makes that 148 different elements that you put in that song um, and makes it sound like it's all in the same room right, somehow. Right. It makes it all sound like it's coming from the same, um, literally the same space. Like yeah. when I say same space, I don't mean metaphorically. I mean like on the planet, like in the same room. I think that's a good way to describe yeah. mastering. I always, I always think of mastering as polish. So you have like you're, it's like you have a clean car, you have a really good mix, and polish, all it does is it makes the entire thing look better and it makes the entire thing look uniform. So yeah. when you have part of mastering is you compress the sound file, which is just a music term that means the lows and the highs, you make the variability between them less so that you can bring the entire volume of the track up. Yeah. So you make it basically as loud as possible while still accenting the lows and accenting the highs, but making the variability between them less. And then you, like Melinda said, you make it so when you have 148 different sounds being played at the same time, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like one sound. Right. And all of this said, you literally need to worry about mastering exactly zero. Zero. Because whoever, <laughs> whoever's working on your track either will master they'll it for you it. or they'll know someone who they'll send it to who will master it. It's, yeah. it's a process that you need some equipment to do and, and some you programs you to do. And you barely need to worry yeah. about mixing too unless you yeah. have an opinion like, hey, this thing, I want it louder or softer. Yeah. But and like, I think as you get more familiar exactly. with these things, you, you start to care about them more because you start to learn how they work and how they're done and how you can affect them yeah so like at first when you're recording a song you might not care about mixing because you don't know anything about it but if you know that oh i could i don't like how my vocals sound on this song that i recorded next time you record when you're going through the mixing stage you can say i want the lead to be louder at this part i want the harmonies to be louder at this part whatever yeah i'm really into this thing right now of zero reverb on my vocals just like and these are all just like little things that you'll yeah. you know and just this super dry super like close intimate like it sounds yeah. like i'm singing right here i'm just really into that right now but anyway so those are just little choices they make and sometimes you want your song to sound like you're singing in your bathroom yeah. or in an opera house or yeah. anyway so and all this all suffice mixing. to say this is how we've done it in the past you can do way less than this or way more than this. I mean, you can record your production could be you tinkering with these things in GarageBand and you have three tracks instead of a hundred. You have your guitar, you have your lead vocals and you have a drum loop that you sure. in there. Yeah. You don't need to do You don't all need 140. By the way, 148 tracks is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that I'm working on i don't want 148 tracks in my songs it just they just keep like you, it, they going they, they sneak up keep, on you they like, sneak up on because, you uh, yeah like in the last chorus of a lot of my songs there are 25 tracks of just my vocals because yeah. i'll throw in some extra harmonies and a lot of times when you throw in a harmony you double it so you can pan it to both sides and then you end up with 25 tracks in your last chorus that are just my voice exactly and that's all yeah that's all fine i think but like i i i've literally been working recently on the in the past 18 months or so of trying to make simpler songs with right. less tracks right because you just get ideas and more ideas and this sounds good and that sounds good so anyway so um the less complicated the better really generally yeah yeah so then Four out of the five stages are done. You move into stage five, which is distribution. So getting the song out to people so they can listen to what you're hearing. And this is probably what 
an outsider would view as the most daunting, and it's probably the easiest one. Easiest uh, thing out of it, all we can four, barely talk all about five it. of these, all but five it, of these. Yeah, it's worth mentioning though because so many people are are. Yeah. They ask, well, how do you get your? It just seems like this impossible thing that right. you have your music on Apple Music. Yeah. And so. Yeah, they think it's some sort of sign of legitimacy, and maybe it is, but the the barrier to entry to getting your music on Spotify or oh my gosh, you're on YouTube. The barrier is so low. It's just people don't know how low it is. Yeah. There's no gatekeepers. There there are none. There you are none. you can absolutely do this. You can you have to pick a distributor. Yeah. The only thing you need to get your music on Spotify is a picture you want to use as your album cover. We'll call that step 5A. So pick pick <laughs> pick your pick your album art. You know, maybe it's a picture of you, maybe it's some design that you have a graphic designer make, whatever. And the second part you need is the sound file that we just explained how to create. So now you have a, a mastered sound file. Five, five B. Five B and five C is you need twenty bucks. And then you pick a distributor. There are probably fifty of them. I've worked with a few of them. There's a few blogs out there that you can literally Google which music distributor should I use, and they'll give you a chart. CD Baby is fantastic. CDBaby.com. Yep. There are a bunch more. AWOL, DistroKid, Ditto, a lot. They the And the parity between them is immense. So they generally all do the same thing. You pay them around 20 bucks. You upload your art. You upload your sound file. And they will put it everywhere for you. They will put it on Apple Music. They will put it on Spotify. They are the distributor. So they distribute yep. to those people. You don't talk to Spotify or Apple Music. You just... Literally, it it's so fast and simple that it's like dumb. It's it, a commoditized service it, because yeah, yeah. It, and f- 10, 15 years ago, that didn't used to be the case, and it was a lot harder to do these things. And distribution it's was it was something that was a pain in the neck for a lot of artists. Yeah, because you know they were their main source of distribution deal. was printing CDs and bringing them to shows, mm-hmm. but now with the advent of global streaming, that's almost free. Yeah. There are these companies that have popped up that will do it for cheap and do it very well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's it literally three things. You you have to have your artwork. You have to have a, a wave file of your song. 20 bucks, I guess four things. Pick a distributor. Yep. And you're, you're literally on Spotify. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> so. Which is cool. And it's then, really and, and cool. And once you do that, once you do that, you will literally log on to Spotify or Apple Music and you will already have a profile. You know, like there there will be a name that you can click on that says Melinda May or Trevor Knight and you click it and it goes to your profile and there are songs. It it's cool. So it yeah. and it's it it looks like something you've built and something you've engineered and you can edit your profile once you have music on there, but it's it's literally created for you when you just upload your things to a distributor. Yeah. And so our hope in discussing all this is that it's really encouraging and that you realize that there are no gatekeepers. And if you're someone who's sitting on a verse and a chorus, this is step by step. It does. It ha- doesn't have to be this dream that's out there for s- that's for someone else. Not for me. It can be for you. <laughs> you know, it's pretty um, tangible. This is how it's done. And this is loosely how every single artist does it mm-hmm. loosely. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that's encouraging. And if you have a song or something that you've been wanting to see on Spotify. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Mm-hmm. And you can do it m- more easily than you think. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And even, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's even more. Sim- we got into the nitty gritty on a, a few of these things just because we love it. I'm really yeah. passionate about yeah, making songs and recording. But you could do it even more simply than that. I think, I don't think you could do it more simply than the five steps that we gave. Yeah. And I mean, um, each one of those steps can be a lot simpler than the way we do it. That's my point. But, but it's essentially those, those five steps. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good wrap on how to how to make a, a song. song and if you have any questions on this or you're interested or you want to bounce ideas off of us reach out to us you can find us on social media as of a few days ago stronger voices podcast on instagram you can email us at contact at stronger voices com. and it is time for the silly question silly ish question so i <laughs> i thought of one before the podcast and then i thought of a different one about a minute ago when i realized wow. i was going to have to do this and huh. i and i like this one better based on what we've talked about today so the question to end today is what is your least favorite song of all time and why this is so hard 
This is so hard. Okay, hold on. Let me think. Songs that I don't like. I know that when they come on, I'm just like, no. Oh, my gosh. Do you have one? I have a couple. What are they? Come on. Go first. So, oh, my gosh. The one of the first songs I remember absolutely hating was Cooler Than Me by Mike Posner. <laughs> I just Why do you hate that I song? I hated it. And and I don't hate a lot of things. <laughs> I don't hate a lot of people. I don't hate <laughs> I hate hardly any people, any food, you know, anything. I don't hate things. Yeah, no, you <laughs> don't dislike a lot of things. I don't. Either. I don't. But when I was however old, you know, I don't remember when that song came out. I want to take a stab and say it came out 2000 2005 2006 hide your face, hide your shades, yeah but you probably do because you're cooler than me yes or okay something. so i remember however i w- old i was 10 11 12 year old trev this song came on the radio when my mom was driving us to practice or school or whatever and i hated it i had such a deep innate hatred of this wow. song I, I thought it was dumb i thought the lyrics were dumb i thought the melody was dumb I thought the guy singing it didn't have a good voice. I was like, why is this song being played to millions of people? This is trash. Wow. <laughs> so that's the first, when I think, when I hear a question like that, or, oh, I hate that song, or, oh, what's your least favorite song? That pops to mind for sure. Yeah. I had a similar feeling about the song Moves Like Jagger by Maroon 5. Yeah. Not as bad, but similar. I, I thought it was dumb. I, I also don't like that song. Um, But yeah, the far and away the thing that sticks out in my mind is cooler than me it's really hard for me to nail down songs i don't like but i know like there are some 80s songs that when they come on i'm just like i i don't enjoy this like i don't want to be <laughs> in this store right now because of this song and, but i kind of forget what they are but the 80s sti- oh, genre man, I, I love it i i hated to break this to you because i know oh. that you like the 80s. well it depends it depends there's some there's some 80s songs that are you know, they go on for five and a half minutes and nothing happens. And yeah. but there are some. Oh, the, man. Just, like, but like Whitney Houston songs. Come on. Of course, I love Whitney Houston songs. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about those like. I love the Whitney Houston style of song, you know, deep bouncing synths, hard percussion, you know, yeah. stacked vocals, upbeat tempos i love it sure and a lot of the 80s music that i listen to is like that well there's probably some in there i don't like but there's i know there's some 80s songs i can't i can't pin them down right now but um they just make me feel weird they're just Ah, too i see i see stop it (laughs) okay (laughs) yeah but i'll answer the question here's a more tangible answer that i can think of there are some songs that i have sung in bars too many times ah and when other people have a few drinks and sing them in bars and everyone's like singing the song i'm just like it's you're disinterested it's too much it's too m- i've done this for too long example now i like this song a lot and i like this artist a lot but when we are in a bar and there's 20 people going sing us a song piano man i'm just like i again? totally get the sentiment are we doing this again i totally get the sentiment <laughs> i would i like the song because it's a very well written song and billy joel is amazing but i would so much rather listen to that song alone in my room yeah. than listen to it at a bar yes at every party that your parents and my parents not uh, not trevor's parents your parents the listeners parents yes have ever been to where people are drinking there is brown eyed girl and everyone is yes. singing along to Brown Eyed Girl. And every girl with brown eyes, who's me as well, is like, the song's about me. <laughs> and I did that too when I was 15. But now I'm 31. And, the, and, then, and then you heard the song three times and you are you thought, okay, I understand this now. I don't, yeah. I don't need to hear it a fourth. Yes. And so that's another one too, that when it's played yeah, like, I, and there's drunken that. singers of Brown Eyed Girl, I'm just like... I want to be a part of this so bad because I love people and I love like the party spirit and everybody yeah. singing the same thing. But it's like, yeah, I know what you else? mean. Yeah. Ooh, another. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about Nickelback. Most things, Nickelback, get out of here. See, off I, the table. I rebel against this. What is this hatred of? You don't. You like Nickelback? Uh, I think they're fine. Okay, what about the song "Rockstar"? How's it go? I don't even want to well, say. We all just want to. <laughs> 
I don't. <laughs> yes, it's that song. I don't even want. I don't even want to give it the time of day to Look bring at it this on. this photograph. We that <laughs> one's better. But I remember when that song came out. It was on every station all the time. Like yeah. every station was playing it. Every fourth song. It was egregious how yeah. how much it was being played. Photograph. Yes. Yes. Rockstar Look. also, and it's a terrible song. We all just want to be big rock stars. Yes. Don't even cars. don't even go there. I'm just trying to figure. I'm just trying to feel it out. Oh, like, is it I really that even. bad? Yes. Yes, it is. There, people just have this hatred for Nickelback that, like, I'm just like, it's okay, justified. their their <laughs> band. That, sure, I've never bought any of their albums. We can go to their show, but like, I exactly, don't know. Exactly. Is what's another Nickelback song? Name one more. It's like it really. Well, I don't listen to them, but oh, that's fair. Um photograph and rockstar the two that come to mind i've heard many of them because unfortunately they used to get played on the radio all the time when my mother was driving me around i think they're like overhated not overrated maybe overhated, overhated. maybe overhated yeah. but i'm definitely in the camp that is not bandwagon hating them but just you just legitimately really don't like yeah, I believe I, I don't you. Like you're not a bandwagon person in <laughs> any regard. I'm not. I'm not. Especially, for example, like you don't like the song "Hey Jude" by the Beatles. I don't. I don't. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Not at all. It's boring. <laughs> hey Jude. <laughs> da, da, da. It's like, come on. They have they have a hundred other songs nah, that are nah, better. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, come on. And then the last four minutes of the song are just na nas. <laughs> do 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 do. It's good. I like it. <laughs> well, then you should listen to it in your free time. <laughs> I'll be in the other I room. I had my time with okay. it. You know, it's past. Okay. Yeah. But I'll that, that is... <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about music is that they make a thousand different genres and every artist makes a thousand different songs because yeah. you don't... Ha not everyone likes the same thing. Yeah. That's yes. that's what's great about working with other musicians or, you know, having a catalog of music is you can have variety because music isn't a zero sum game. People yes. listen to more than one artist and the artists they listen to, they don't like all their songs anyway. Yep. And the, you listen to unlimited number of exactly. artists. It's not like I'm shopping for a computer. People are probably only going to buy one type. Yeah. Music is not that they're going to listen. Everyone has two minutes to listen to. to yeah, a song. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. And I think that just about does it for today. What do you think? I think so. I think we covered it all. Thanks for sticking with us. We got into the music weeds today, and I hope you enjoyed it. I know we definitely did. I yeah. kind of got lost in that conversation, and I know this is... Because we're passionate about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. You exactly. Know? And we would... Yeah. Yeah. So if you have listened to it, thank you. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing with your time, so thanks for spending it with us. And we have a lot more material to come, so I hope to see you at the next episode. See you at the next episode. Keep your eyes on us. Lots more podcasts. Lots more music coming out. So thanks. See you soon. We encourage you to reach out to us directly at contact at strongervoicespodcast.com with questions, comments, or discussion topics. We wholeheartedly thank you for your support. If you like Stronger Voices, we humbly ask you to do two things. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. And copy this link right now and send it to the person you care most about in this world. Thank you again, and we'll see you for the next episode of Stronger Voices.